This is Counter Argument, a Middle East podcast from the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. It's common among those of us interested in political questions, such as the future of the Middle East or the nature of protests in the region, to sideline art as something peripheral. We think of it as not central to more important questions that political science, economics, or history can answer. Yet looking at the 2022 protests in Iran and moving backwards and also across various parts of the Middle East, it's constantly art. Graphic arts in the form of posters or banners, poetry in the form of slogans or protest songs that emerge and act as enduring symbols of the protesters' grievances and demands. Often this art, argues our guest today, Sultan Saud al-Qasimi, is created by women who increasingly stand at the intersection of art and politics in the Middle East. Sultan Saud al-Qasimi is a columnist, researcher, teacher, and art collector who founded the Barjil Art Foundation in Sharjah, United Arab Emirates, devoted to modern art of the Middle East. In the first episode of Counter Argument, we talked to al-Qasimi about some of the misconceptions surrounding the link between politics and art, the importance of modern art in the Middle East, and the role women have played and continue to play in the intersection of art, politics, and economics in the region. My name is Nagma Sohrabi. We are the Crown Center for Middle East Studies, and this is Counter Argument. Welcome, Sultan, to the Counter Argument podcast. It's lovely to have you here today. Thank you, Nagma. It's lovely to be with you and to be back in one way or another at the Crown Center. The Crown Center had the pleasure of going to the Bajil Cultural Center and see the works of art that you collected. So could you talk to us a little bit about how you got interested in this and how that came about? So uh, I started collecting art 20 years ago in 2002 after visiting a number of exhibitions with my late father and my mom. And I was very interested in how modern art can tell the story of the Middle East and could modern art play a role in expanding the dialogue about Middle East. And we know that people know about the Middle East mostly from the news. Some people know about the Middle East from newspapers, other media, movies, some music, but modern art really didn't play a major role in this conversation. And I saw that many other parts of the world were able to extend this conversation through modern art, and I wondered whether we could do the same with art from the Middle East. But why modern art and why this kind of bringing it together, curating a certain type of uh, modern art? So my father and my mom and I used to go to galleries in the early 2000s. And I remember we walked into an exhibition of a Palestinian couple, Tamam Al-Akhal, who's still alive, and her late husband, Ismail Shamoud. And they were pioneer Palestinian artists, active from the 1950s onward, documented a lot of the trials and tribulations that the Palestinians went through over the past 70 years or so. And I remember walking in with my dad, who's not very art literate, neither was I, But because the work was very figurative, because the work was able to depict major events, my father was explaining to me that this is Black September, this is Yasser Arafat, this is a certain event that took place in Lebanon, these are the refugee camps. And I noticed that somebody who isn't really well versed in art became very animated and was immediately touched and immediately felt a connection with this work. So to me, what you said means that in some ways, one of the reasons why modern Middle Eastern art becomes central to our conversation about politics, about economics, about society in the Middle East is that it's an entryway. And that's the story that you told. It seems to me, based on our conversations and also the work that you've done so far, that you're making a broader argument for why you know, you cannot understand Middle Eastern politics, you cannot understand Middle East economics, you cannot understand Middle Eastern society without centering art in that conversation. So can you actually explain a bit more why you have been so effectively making that argument? That's a great question, Nami. Actually, what I would say is you cannot understand Middle Eastern politics or society without understanding Middle Eastern cultures And so art is a single component of these cultures. The cultures also include food. The cultures include poetry. So there's many other aspects of cultures. And I think art or modern art is an important avenue or tool in this conversation because people immediately associate with it because you need not be literate in poetry. You need not know metaphors. You need not know all these deep reference points 
sometimes with figurative art, just snaps at you, you immediately understand what's going on, what's being depicted. And there are many, many examples of how modern Middle Eastern identity was formed through the visual arts. When you think about early 20th century Turkey, when Ataturk came to power, following the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. He went about redoing the entire cultural and visual sphere of Turkey, even what people could wear. He changed their outfits. The portraits of the Ottoman rulers were taken down, a new portrait of westernized-looking leaders himself, really, and a small coterie of his colleagues were depicted thousands of times, and these portraits were hung everywhere. Currencies also play an important role, the national anthem. All these things that people don't really associate with art are really elements of art and culture. So you cannot understand Iran without understanding this movement called the Takahane. You cannot understand Iraq without understanding the Baghdad Modern Arts Group and why it emerged and what happened and how the intellectuals were forming circles of friendships between themselves, the novelists, the poets, the painters, the sculptors, the public monument people. And so all these things sort of coalesced to form a new identity that we see today, the ramifications of, we still see them today. I'm sorry to keep going on and on, but during the protests of Iraq in 2019, the Iraqi youth coalesced around this massive monument called the Monument to Liberation that was designed by late Jawad Salim and late Rifat Jadarji, in 1958. Can you describe the monument a bit for our listeners? Yes, it's this massive monument that's almost 50 meters long and 20 meters high, and it has 25 figures on it. And these are bronze figures that depict the liberation of the Iraqis from the yoke of colonialism and the monarchy. And so you see a central figure that's breaking through the chains and freeing himself, but you also see women and men hand in hand rebuilding a new nation, which is supposed to be post-monarchy Iraq. And so this monument was supposed to be a celebration or a depiction of Iraq from 1958 onwards. And Iraqis, 60 years on, in 2019, went and surrounded this monument and protested around this monument. The name of the monument is the Monument to Liberation. So it resonated even with the youth who were born in the year 2000. So it's very, very powerful. And by the way, these youth protected the monument. These youth were cleaning the monument. There are videos on Twitter of these Iraqi youth installing light bulbs. I had my hand on my heart because I think this would be done by a professional team. But it was so beautiful to see Iraqis claim ownership of this giant monument that's been sitting there for 60 years, neglected by government after government, them cleaning it, them installing these little light bulbs so that it lights up at night. You feel that it resonated with them. And that was a beautiful sight to behold. I was just thinking in some ways, the answer to the question that you've given is two things, right? One is that these circles of politics that we give all this power to are building also around questions of culture, right? So these groups of trust, if you want to call it, friends who gather together are also gathering around culture. But also, I think to put it, you know, very simply, it matters because it matters to the people on the ground. And we keep writing it out in some ways. And I think your example really beautifully demonstrated that. Connected to that is the issue of iconography of revolutions and social movements, going back to things that matter to people and therefore should matter to those of us who are interested in understanding the Middle East. And, you know, of course, as we're recording this, it's 2022, and the issue of all these women-led protests inside Iran is on everyone's mind. And you can't get away from the fact that almost the entirety of not just the requests and the claims being made by these youth, but also the iconography of what's going on in Iran is a female-centered iconography. And you and I have spoken before about how there is actually a history and a precedent to this. And it's not exclusive to Iran, but it has been going on in the Middle East for a while. Can you talk to us a little bit about 
the history of this iconography, the importance of it, and give us one or two examples of what you mean when you're talking about that. I want to start by talking about one of my favorite monuments in the Middle East. It's the monument called the Azadi Tower, or what people today refer to as Azadi Tower. This was a monument that was designed 50 years ago or so by an Iranian architect called Hussein Amanat, who is a very, very respected architect in the region. And he designed this for the Shah. And it was called the Shahyad Monument. Shahyad, which is the monument in celebration of the Shah, I believe. And so that monument, Tahmi, stood there for a few years under the Shah's era. And then when the Islamic Revolution happened, the revolution government appropriated the image changed the name and started using that monument as a venue to have all these major speeches and all these military parades. So they really took ownership of it, even though it was built to celebrate another era. They took it because it's so visible. You can't miss it if you're in Tehran, which, by the way, the same thing happens in Baghdad and Damascus and Cairo. There are these public monuments that you just can't miss. And so what was beautiful in the last few weeks in Tehran during this uprising, there were videos that started being distributed on TikTok and Twitter and also on Instagram of women dancing and removing their veils in front of this Azadi monument. And so the people are reappropriating the monument that was appropriated by the government. It's an incredibly beautiful sight. And I would add to what you said that the government appropriated from the revolutionary people because it was the end point of so many demonstrations in the fall of 1978, which just confirms the point that you're making about how these monuments keep getting folded into big political and social that's movements. Right, that's right. I love yeah. that. <laughs> There's so many examples of people in Iran, in Sudan, in Iraq, in Lebanon, of women that were at the forefront of these revolutions. And one that comes to my mind is Ala Talah, who was the Sudanese protest leader, who was photographed in 2019 atop a car. And that picture went everywhere. It was viral. It was peak social media. What was she doing on top of the car? She was delivering a speech. She was delivering a chant. The chant rhymes in Arabic, and it goes along the lines of, Bashir, we want you to step down. We want our freedom. We demand our freedom. And so not only did that image go viral, but illustrators and artists started painting her. Instagram images and accounts popped up. There were all these manipulated photographs of her with the moon behind her and the sun behind her and angelic sort of imagery with the clouds. It was just so beautiful to see, again, the Sudanese women. And because she dressed like other Sudanese, she looked like other Sudanese. She is one of the people. And that's why that image, I think, resonated with Sudanese more than others. Let's say, for instance, more than an image of a Sudanese person protesting in the West who the Sudanese couldn't relate to. So that, I think, was a very powerful image as well. You're giving me goosebumps (laughs) when we're talking, when you're talking about this. But going back to the question, you know, I think for a lot of people, because we're so presentist, right, we see what's in front of us and we think, oh, okay, we invented female iconography, we invented women graphic artists being part of social movements. But you seem to say that there's a history to it, right? That it goes beyond this moment. Oh, yeah. So initially, let's say that women in the Middle East were part of developing the new national identities, the new cultural references of people. Women were part of that, other than them being educators and being singers and being musicians, but a lot of them, especially the artists, played an important role. If you think of people like Munir Farman Farmayan, who brought back Iranian mirror art back into the 20th century, something that was neglected for many, many years. If you think of Bahjad Sadr as well, with her references to Iran and her paintings. For me, my favorite example is an Egyptian artist called Inji Eflatun. And Inji Eflatun in the 1930s and 40s created these stencils that Egyptians who were protesting against the monarchy and against the British colonial presence started replicating and painting all over the streets of Cairo. 
So just her and then depictions of police brutality and uh, colonial brutality against Egyptians, that was definitely part of a concerted effort by women. Inji Eflatun goes in 1945, a few months after Paris was liberated from the Nazis, goes to Paris and represents the African continent when she was 18 years old in a conference on global women's rights. So this is a young artist that represents the continent of Africa. So she even has this manifesto called 80 million women with us. And she talks about the 80 million women of Africa that all demand freedom. So I'm not saying that it was exclusively women artists who did that, but I am saying that women artists and artists in general played an important part in the revolutionary movement, in the emancipation movement. All you have to do is think about what artists and activists were doing in 1968 all over the world. And this is not just a Middle East thing. This is something that you see in Paris and you see all over Europe and even in North America. Can you tell us actually more about Inge Aflatun? Because she's so amazing. And I think not that many people in the mainstream are actually talking about her or even know her. What was her background? And also maybe if you could describe a bit more the stencils that she was making that became so popular at the time. So Inge Flatoon was the daughter of this well-to-do businesswoman. Her mother actually got a divorce from the father. So that was, I wouldn't say progressive. I don't think divorcing is progressive, but she took ownership of her life, which is amazing. She was Gada. Yeah, Gada. So she was a woman who was influenced by an Egyptian communist artist called Kamil Tilmasani, who taught her and mentored her as a child and opened her eyes to the injustices that Egypt was going through in the 1930s and 40s when she was a child. And then she left school and started a women's rights movement and a labor rights movement and protested in the streets. And in fact, her activism cost her dearly. She was sent to jail for four and a half years between 1958 and 1962 because of her activism during the Nasser years. Yes, Kamal Abdel Nasser, who was a socialist, sentenced her because she was really a communist and she was demanding much more than he was willing to give. And she created this stencil in the 1950s that depicted a large sort of sea of protesters carrying coffins in the streets of Cairo, depicting Egyptians who were killed by the brutality of the British occupation and the British military presence in Iraq. Another series of works she created was the execution of this Egyptian farmers at the hands of these British colonial forces. The painting is sort of depicted from behind the soldiers as they are observing and overlooking the execution, while the families of the farmers are begging the soldiers to have mercy on them. And so she really was active not only in local issues like in Egypt, but also in global causes such as the Palestinian cause, for instance, in the 1950s, all the way to the 1970s. Just out of curiosity, what happened to her? Inji Aflaton was jailed for four and a half years, as I said, for her activism. And when she was in jail, she convinced the prison warden to let her paint because as other women prisoners were maybe knitting, maybe cooking, maybe doing something else, she told them, listen, I come from a well-to-do family. My mother was a fashion designer. I do not know how to cook. I do not know how to do these things. I'm a great artist. So finally, the prison warden was convinced because she had won first prize just a few weeks before she was jailed at this major national competition. She took the newspaper clipping to the warden who allowed her ultimately to paint as long as she abided by two conditions. Condition number one is never depict the prison guards. And condition number two is never paint anyone on death row. No one in the orange jumpsuit, as you call it. And so she had to abide by that. Her paintings were very small, really as big as a laptop. Most of them just tiny works because that's what she could afford in prison. And then when she was released, she was sort of reformed between quotations and she abided by the rules in the country. And there was a really sad twist to the story because when she was released, she went to France to exhibit and her former comrades in arms, as they say, were sort of disappointed that she had been slightly pacified, if that is the word. But she was a great artist. She continued to depict global human rights causes, but I understand where she comes from and what she did. Did she die in Paris or did she die in Egypt? She died in the 80s in Egypt. You know, she had a beautiful quote. I don't want to make this podcast about M.G. Flaton, but she had a beautiful quote in the 1980s. Becky LaDuke, who is an American author and even artist, interviewed her. And N.G. said, Abdel Nasser was a good man 
even though he jailed me, I know that he loved the country. Let's listen to Inji Aflatun tell this story in her own voice. ومن أول يوم في السجن حسيت إن عندي رغبة شديدة للرسم ولكن المشكلة إزاي أرسم كل شيء ممنوع في في السجن بعد معركة طويلة وعذاب يعني وافقت الإدارة إن أرسم لكن بشرط إن تأخذ الأعمال وتبيعها لمصلحة السجن اللي حصل إن بعد كده قدرت أرسم كنت في الأول يعني أسلمها للإدارة وأرجع تاني أشتريها أو زميلاتي يعني فطبعا كنت حاجة يعني صعبة أول وفي النهاية كنت بهرب الصور عن طريقة دكاترة والسجنات it's a really great topic to move on to the next part of what we want to talk about, which is why it is that so many of these stories are unknown, right? And I think one of the reasons may be this idea, this misconception that people have that Middle Eastern art is Islamic and it's miniature and it's calligraphy. It's not this kind of modern art that you've been talking about. Um, so I'm wondering if you can think with us about whether that is one of the misconceptions that people mm-hmm. have, and if so, how we can move away from that kind of thinking about Middle Eastern art. In fact, Nagme, in the early days of recognition of modern art from the Middle East, you find that these artworks were displayed in Islamic galleries, in Islamic wings of Western museums, or they would be in ethnography wings. They wouldn't be in the modern art wings. They would be almost anywhere else but the modern art wings. Maybe their own special exhibitions. And it took decades for the Metropolitan Museum and the Tate to include Middle Eastern art as part of their permanent hang and not just a very short-term hang. We saw this in some exhibitions that took place in the 60s and 70s. You had Iranian and Iraqi and Sudanese and even Moroccan artists who were shown for a few weeks, but that was it. There is a misconception here that modern art from the Middle East is a continuation of Islamic art. And I can tell you and I can assure you that Islamic art continued. People continue to make Islamic art. But modern art that referenced modernities, that references a new concept, that references new theories, this is really a product of the turn of the century and a product in many cases of the mid-20th century in the Middle East. If I could just talk about two, three movements. There is a movement known as Saka Khane. The Saka Khane is an important movement that was founded in Iran in the mid-20th century. And amongst the leading artists are Parviz Tanavoli, Charles Hussein Zandaroudi, and many other artists. These artists actually drew inspiration from Islam, but they also drew inspiration from secular Persian poetry, which is not Islamic. And they drew inspiration from calligraphy. They drew inspiration from architecture. They drew inspiration from nature, which is not Islamic. They drew inspiration from a variety of sources, and they amalgamated them. They brought them together and included Islamic references as well. But then, ultimately, they produced a new style that is inspired by Persian folklore, that is inspired by Persian music, that is inspired by Persian landscape. This is not Islamic. This is a product of the mid-20th century modernity of Iran. And the same thing happened with Iraq. In Iraq, there was a group called the Baghdad Modern Art Group that was born in 1951 by two artists, Jawad Salim and Shakir Hassan al Said. These two artists came together and they announced the birth of modern Iraqi art. And they said, we are drawing from global artistic inspiration. They say, just like Picasso was inspired by African masks, we want to be inspired by global art. And so these artists are looking at beyond the very limited scope of national identity or regional identity or religious identity. They are looking at global movements. They are following artists like Diego Rivera. They're following artists like Rothko. They're going east and west, and they're drawing inspiration from everywhere. And they are looking at Babylonian history, at Sumerian history, and which is not Islamic. So it's not right to say that this is Islamic. And the final example I'll give you is a movement in Egypt known as neo pharaohism neo pharaohism which is inspired by pharaonic art in the early 20th century Egypt that is certainly pre-Islamic. And so for people to say that modern art from the Middle East is a product of Islamic art, that is incorrect. 
I would say, yes, it is inspired in part by Islamic art. Because you cannot but be inspired by Islamic art. You have Kamal Bulata, a Palestinian artist who is Christian, who says that I grew up near the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, and so I saw it every day. Of course, I would have it as a cultural reference. But he wasn't an Islamic writer or an Islamic artist. So it's important to draw this distinction. So when you were talking about how initially modern Middle East art was hanging in the Islamic wing of, let's say, the Met, this idea of modern Middle East art being Islamic has economic implications, mm-hmm. right? What are the global art market implications of moving away from this misconception and thinking about modern Middle East art as a global form of art versus pigeonholing it into, let's say, Islamic or traditional or any other kinds of words that people use? So, unfortunately, there are museums in America that still continue to put modern Middle Eastern art in their Islamic wing. And I really think that this should be rethought. A museum that I love very much, the MFA in Boston, fantastic museum, they still have Munir Farman Farmayan in the Islamic wing. They still have Wasma Shorbaji in the Islamic wing. And I really think that they need to look at it as modern art, again, with Islamic inspirations, but definitely modern art. And talking about pricing and auctions, just... Recently, one of the folios from the Iranian Shahnameh book was sold for $8 million, just a single folio. And so this shows you that there's a huge market for Islamic art or for Islamic-inspired art. But modern art from the Middle East, you're still looking at 2 to $3 million tops. Fakhr Nisa Zaid, these are the most expensive artworks, I'll tell you that. Fakhr Nisa, a Turkish artist, was married to an Iraqi and then lived in Jordan, very much from the region and of the region. Her work sold for about $2.8, $2.9 million. A Egyptian artist, Mahmoud Saeed, his work sold for about $2.5 million. Other records were by Iran's Munir Farman Farmayan and Farhad Mushiri. And so these artists are commanding records, not as high as their peers in the West. And I think... This is still a product of lack of recognition internally and externally of these artists and what they can achieve. You are seeing figures at much higher rates in Western artists and some Asian, Japanese, Chinese, and even Indian artists started to command higher numbers. Nigerian artists, Ben Enwonwo, has commanded over $2 million. So that's really fascinating to see there is recognition for sort of non Western art in the world. And I think that museums play an important role in this. And the fact that when visitors see this art in modern wings, they recognize it as being of great value. So this is a process that's going to take a long time. We're still not there yet. It occurred to me when you were talking, though, that there's this weird contradiction going on in terms of how people think about the importance of modern Middle East art and then the market value of it. And by that, I mean, we started this conversation by saying people don't think that art stands at the center of politics. And then we had a conversation about that. But as you were talking about the art market, it occurred to me that so many of these works seem to gain more value when there is a political background to them. Almost like they have to have a message. Otherwise, nobody wants to look at them in the market world. Is that actually correct? Could you be a modern Middle East artist and just produce, let's say, an art that says nothing about the modern Middle East? Would anybody even want to exhibit it? Or do you always, as an artist, have to represent that current political moment. I definitely think that artists should be free to represent anything they want. And in fact, we have an exhibition that's touring the U.S. and now is in Chicago, and it was at Boston College's McMullen Museum in 2021. That exhibition is dedicated to abstract art from the region. And so you have abstract artists that are doing calligraphy, like Kamal Bulata, as we mentioned him, who was inspired by the Dome of the Rock. You have artists from all over the region who did not do figurative work. What they did was abstraction. Sometimes, Narme, you think that an artwork is not political, but it is political. So, for instance, if you know the history of the Middle East and North Africa, you would think of the Amazigh culture, something that is not immediately legible to you and I, 
if we did not know Amazigh history, we would look at the Yaz symbol, which is the symbol of freedom. For anyone, it looks like a letter C with two lines going through it. But in reality, it's the symbol of freedom. So if you don't have the keys to understand the significance, you would think that this is not political. But there are a lot of just landscape paintings. There's a lot of calligraphy that is not political and just abstract geometric work that is not political. Or so we think. Sometimes there are political connotations. You obviously made me think of Tano Voli's Hitch. Yeah, exactly. Whose meaning has shifted yeah. in the past 50 years. The meaning of Hitch, which is nothing. The meaning of nothing. What is nothing? It's the idea of nothingness, the idea of zero, the idea of the void, the idea of emptiness. It's so powerful. And where you place it makes it even more powerful. And so Tanavoli really brought together calligraphy, modernity, public art, monuments, all these things in that single sculpture that is immediately one of the most recognizable works from the Middle East. And in fact, I noticed that the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto in Canada has installed the piece outside and it is one of the most photographed works. It's become iconic. People do not go to that museum without taking a picture with Tanavoli's Hitch. Yeah, so fascinating. You know, in our conversation today, in different ways, you've given us counter arguments for the idea that first, art does not matter for politics. Second, that women occupy a secondary or diminished role in art and activism in the region. And that Middle East art is basically just Islamic art. So to wrap it up, I was wondering if you could talk to us either about a specific work of art or theme that has emerged out of women artists that has taken you by surprise, something that you had not been expecting going into it. And when you did, it took you in particular by surprise. So over the past three, four years, I've dedicated most of my energy into uncovering works by women artists that I didn't know about. And I'm very happy to say that my level of recognition is still low. And I like that because I'm still learning. As I collect, as I learn, I learn of how ignorant I was of how many great women artists they were. And I often get asked, do you know a certain artist? And I say, I don't. And people tell me, well, but you've been spending 20 years reading about Middle Eastern art. I tell them that's the beauty of Middle Eastern art. Somebody who spent 20 years can still learn and can still find out about so many artists. And so one thing that surprises me constantly is how versatile and how creative women artists are from the region. Whereas male artists, most of them, did paint, some print, and sculpture. Women went into using henna. Women went into using sand. Women started working on burlap. Women started doing tapestry. Women started doing glass works. Women started doing ceramic. They were literally cooking the artworks. And so women were much more versatile, were much more creative with how they make work than men were, which is why I love this idea of expanding the canon, of us saying that, no, a tapestry, a carpet, wool work, glassware, this could all be modern art from the Middle East. It's not just the painting and the sculpture and the print that most men had access to because it's expensive to do sculpture work. You needed to have government stipends. You need to have government scholarships, which most women didn't get. So what would women do? Women would be creative. They would be resourceful. They would find ways to create art. And that's why I'm really enjoying learning about how diverse my region is when it comes to modern art. I was wondering, can you give us an example of, of the artist that you talked about who makes art on sand? So I'd like to speak about one artist who did work on sand called Munira Nusaybe. She was born in Jerusalem in the early 1940s. And then when her brother got a job here in Abu Dhabi in the UAE, working as an advisor to the then president of the UAE, Sheikh Zayed, who passed away, she came to visit him and she stayed for 14, 15 years in the Emirates. And then she said, well, there's this thing in abundance, which is the sand. And she started incorporating sand in her oil painting. So she would incorporate tar with sand and oil and create these visions of the region, landscapes and figurative work. And you notice when you approach the work that it is layered and there's a certain texture that you can see on a screen, but if you see the work with your own eyes, you feel like there's something behind the oil that is just hidden. And that is the essence. The sand is the earth, is the essence, is the soil of this land. 
And that is what she incorporated in her art. Is she recognized, at least in parts of the region? No, no. As most women artists, not recognized. Unfortunately, and I've been telling people that she deserves a major retrospective here in Abu Dhabi, in the UAE specifically, because that is where she spent the late 60s to the early 80s. And she saw the rise of the UAE. And I really hope that my pleas don't fall on deaf ears and that she gets an exhibition because she's approaching her 80s and she definitely deserves, like so many other women and even men artists, deserve to see recognition with an exhibition and a book and literature and scholarship for what they have done and what they have recorded over the past half century. When you were saying that, I was just thinking about all the artists that I know in Iran that you just want to make that plea for. There are so many of them. But I'm really glad that we got a chance to talk about her on our podcast. And thank you so much, Sultan, for having this conversation with us today. It was really, really illuminating and a very thoughtful conversation about modern Middle East art. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to the team that's working effortlessly behind the scene, including Karen and Ramiar and everybody else. You've been listening to Counter Argument, a Middle East podcast from the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. Please join us next time for more insights into the region's politics, history, society, and economics.